Um, LAO, nothing. Uh, finance, public comment. Madam Chair and Senator Monning, Elizabeth Landsberg with the Western Center on Law and Poverty. And we don't necessarily have an opinion about whether the Calhier's position should be um, moved over to OSI, but we did want to share with the committee our recent experiences with Calhier's. First, we very much appreciate that advocates did have the opportunity twice in the last six months to do user acceptor testing. So I got to go to CalHERS. We put in some case scenarios and saw how the upcoming releases were going to work. So that was great for us to do. We did it once in October and once last month. We did identify some defects that we've been sharing with CalHERS, Covered California, um, and, and all the parties, but that's been a useful piece to be able to do. We are frustrated with a lack of detail in the roadmap. The roadmap ends in September in six mm -hmm. months. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the following quarters just say future initiatives. Mm -hmm. um, so we appreciate the committee's attention to that. That's great if Cal hears this meeting with SCIU um, about the roadmap, but we would appreciate it if advocates would also be shared, uh, if, if that information would also be shared with us um, as well. You know, getting the roadmap at the beginning of 2015 was a major accomplishment. We had an opportunity to weigh in on priorities with the legislature. Some changes were made in the prioritization, which we appreciated, but without the roadmap, um, only going six months, we're not able to do that. Mm -hmm. There are still very significant issues with CalHERS. Um, last month, the California Healthcare Foundation put out a report and they looked at some user experiences. A couple of things, some people just kept um, rolling through the shop and compare, not understanding that they weren't actually applying for coverage. They also noted a number of issues that we've been working with the departments on in terms of lack of clarity about a lot of the income information, as the chairwoman noted. You can, and there's different screens where you enter different types of income. There's one that just asks for miscellaneous income. If you put in non-countable income like SDI, it's counted and you're put in covered California wrong instead of Medi-Cal. So we, there is a AB 1296 income work group where we're addressing some of those issues. We're told there's a mega change release coming with a lot of those income changes. Um, sounds exciting. We don't know when that's going to be. So we've appreciated the dialogue, but we would appreciate more clarity because I can tell you that today some people are getting incorrect um, income determinations. The 2016 FPL levels are still not in the system. So it's March 17th, 2016, and we're still using the 2015 federal poverty level um, numbers. I'm no programmer, but I don't understand why it's difficult just to put in those new numbers. So we'd appreciate um, understanding why that hasn't happened because that happened last year that the new FPL numbers weren't put in until April. And then what happens is the counties or the departments have to go back and correct some people's eligibility because they're put into the wrong program. When are the new FPL levels released? They are released by the feds in January. It would be nice if they came in December, but um, you know we don't understand why they're not in the system yet. There are still um, also some problems with the immigration rules, some incorrect eligibility determinations for some groups of, of immigration. Um, I think some of those are in the works, but again, we're concerned about that. Um, and, and notices, we are pleased that SB 1341 by the chairwoman is being implemented and we've heard good things. Phase one of that is being implemented and then next year we'll look to phase two and one of our priorities, which is consolidated notices so that families will get one notice and not multiple notices. We still think there's confusion about notices. Um, consumers who apply at a county are still getting a, a notice um, that's branded as Covered California, which is very confusing for consumers. There is a notices work group and, and we're giving a lot of input, but we would say there's still a lot of work to do on notices. There are still also significant problems with transitions between Medi-Cal and Covered California. We understand there's a plan change release for that in the fall. We've asked to see the business rules and that has not yet been provided, but we're concerned about those transitions. Um, former foster youth, which is something that was addressed. Mm -hmm. The good news is that former foster youth who check that they are a former foster youth are no longer asked for income information, which they shouldn't be if they're applying by themselves. Mm -hmm. But if they're applying even with a non-applicant family member, they're still asked for information. And they're told at the end that they have to submit verification of their former foster youth status, which they should not be. So that's a defect that we hoped would be fixed before May, and we're told it'll still take a couple of months. So some good progress has been made, but it's too bad that, you know, these youth who are the responsibility of the state of California, there are still some problems. Programs for pregnant women, again, that was something that was prioritized last year. And finally, um, 
after the system being live for two years, as of October of last year, the system does finally determine pregnant women eligible for the Medi-Cal Access Program, so we're very happy that that's in. There's still some um, tweaking to do on some of the messaging. Any pregnant woman is told you at the end on the eligibility results page, you have to pay the MCAT premium or you'll be sent to collections regardless of whether. So, so there's still a lot of, of um, changes to be made. And then there's still no user, super user functionality for Covered California. So Covered California staff who know there's a problem still have to send a trouble ticket to the vendor. And so we hope that that will be addressed this year. Um, so those are some of our concerns. We appreciate the AB 1296 process and the legislature's oversight. Still a lot of work to do to make sure the system works for Californians. Thank you. Before we move on, could you respond to some of the issues she raised? I know it was a laundry list. Um, but again, just as you earlier framed kind of your sphere of direct influence versus not, some of the issues she raised, do they fall in your basket and um, where do they fall in the priorities? Can I get the easy one first? Sure. The, the FPL tables are, they come in late, so we have a scheduled release for those at the end of this month. End of this month. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Anything, anything we can do to move that up? If we know that they don't come until January, this is something that we'll have to do every year. What can we do differently next year? We will work on processes to improve that. We will schedule to come into this release that we had. Um, mm -hmm. But again, so it's, it's, it's a planning effort. Mm -hmm. and with the planning effort and the testing effort, it just fell at the end of the month because we, we just need adequate time to plan for those. Got things. it. I'm just saying that since that's unlike some of these other fixes, once you fix them, it'll be fixed. This will be an annual thing we have to do and if, whatever we can do structurally to move it up, primarily because it impacts the workload of others in terms of having to go back and make those adjustments. So if that could be looked at in future years. Thank you. Um, as, as was mentioned, uh, income is a priority and how income is treated across programs. Mm -hmm. And that's why it is uh, a priority mm -hmm. for both uh, project sponsors to be able to do that. There's work groups going on, and that is one of the highest priorities, as well as noticing, refining the noticing, and any confusion um, about that noticing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So those remain uh, priorities. Uh, some of those defects that were mentioned, we'd have to go back and be able to look at those. I don't have that information. Okay. And it would be helpful if, if in, in your upcoming meetings where you're going to roll out the uh, um, 2017 kind of vision and plan if the advocate community could be included beyond SCIU who are the utilizers, that would be helpful. Yes, ma'am. Great, thank you, Madam Chair and members. Kathy Senderling McDonald with the County Welfare Directors Association. Really appreciate the opportunity to comment on the um, last year of effort around CalHERS and the improvements that have been made and the work that we still have ahead of us. Definitely SB 1341 phase one has been a huge accomplishment. It was a huge lift for the SAW systems to get those notices shifted over, had to coordinate very closely with CalHERS, so it made the necessary changes to stop sending those notices. And as Ms. Landsberg indicated, um, we've heard nothing but good things so far, um, knock on wood, that it's gone smoothly for the last two weeks and we're sending the notices out properly and timely that we could not previously send out. There's a number of other improvements that go along with that. The ability, for example, to make some changes to the notices if there's a specific case that you need to personalize the notice to be able to do that as well. Um, in addition, the ability to deny applications, which is something that a year ago um, I stood here and told you our, our workers couldn't actually mm -hmm. tell someone you're not eligible, uh, called negative of action on a case, um, also the inability to discontinue in certain circumstances. That's now been put into the system. There were some legal issues with the structure of notices that remained in CalHERS that have also been addressed with the SB 1341. So I think we're now able to really take full advantage of that negative action functionality being put into CalHERS. That was also a lift for CalHERS and we really appreciate that getting done over the last year. And additionally, we do want to echo what Mr. Boulay noted about the governance structure, CWD DA does have a seat at the table at the Executive Steering Committee, the Project Steering Committee, and the Project Coordinating Committee. Thank you to me for getting all three of those properly named. Um, it can be alphabet soup. Um, I personally do sit on the Executive Steering Committee and the Project Steering Committee and uh, participate. And we may not be officially a voting member because of the two project sponsors being the lead, but typically we are given a vote. For example, there was a decision whether we go or no go with the release that included SB 1341. We were asked to provide our input to that and of course said go in that situation. 
I will say all of that um, said, a lot of work does remain. I think Ms. Landsberg did a really great job summarizing, so I'll try not to duplicate what she said, but maybe add a couple things in that are important to, to counties. Um, one thing that she mentioned was uh, the, com the combined notices for people who are on more than one program. So that might include Magi Medi-Cal and non-Magi Medi-Cal. It might include Magi Medi-Cal and the APTC coverage or just unsubsidized coverage under Cover Cal. SB 1341, your bill, Madam Chair, said which system should actually send those notices, mm -hmm. and then AB 617 had details on what those notices need to say, and then put the July 1st date of 2017 in those, for those combined notices to be put together. There's some other changes that need to be made in CalHERS in order to enable our staff um, and our SAWS systems to have more transparency into the rules and the decisions that CalHERS makes. You may hear people talk about that as exposing the rules. There's a number of components to that. Some of those are important drivers to the ability to do the combined notices. So it's very important to us that those pieces get done early in 2017 so that we can meet that July 1st date for the combined notices. Uh, the other thing that we're working closely with the state um, partners and with OSI and CalHERS team on are the continued duplicate applications and duplicate cases. I think this is something we also talked about last year. We've just seen hundreds of thousands of duplicate cases and duplicate um, applications through the last several years. Um, 72 duplicate applications is the record. Most are people who submit two or three. So that is not that is the exception, not the norm, the, the, the 72. But having somebody submit that many applications, work does need to be done to be able to identify that those are duplicates, to not have that happen in the first place, and to make it more difficult for that to occur. Specifically related to the issues on the agenda, we support the move of the project staffing to OSI. We think that that's the right place to be given that you have multiple sponsors on the project and OSI has the expertise to be able to oversee that. So we definitely support um, your approval of that when you do take the, the action later in the process. We also agree with the concerns around the lack of detail on the roadmap for 2017. There's sort of two aspects to that. One is what goes into the releases and the other is when are the releases actually happening? And as you can see from the current version, we don't have either of those things nailed down. The when is really important. I think Ms. Landsberg did a nice job of talking about the what. Um, SAWs in particular, the SAW systems, need to know when the releases are planned so they can work together to coordinate their ability to be ready to go for those dates. Uh, a good example is actually with the leader replacement system, LRS, that's rolling out right now in LA. They actually made changes to their schedule and to their rollout structure to accommodate the need for certain release uh, timeframes for CalHERS. And doing that early in advance in 2015 um, and, and even earlier to the extent possible was, was really critical for them to be able to make those adjustments. Right now, we don't know what the dates are that are even proposed for the releases, so we really need to get that going. It's already mid-March, and it's going to be really hard to shift stuff around if we need to if we don't get those dates. So we are involved, as you know, in the governance process. We'll continue to be involved in those, but just a plea for us to really nail that stuff down as quickly as possible in a coordinated way. Um, and then um, finally, just to say it would not be, I think, fair for me to stand here and talk about the tremendous amount of work that it still creates for the problems that our workers face. I think you'll hear from some in a minute. Um, over 100 manual workarounds still exist in the system for our eligibility staff, um, and also um, about half that would also affect the service center representatives at, um, at uh, Cover California. Without acknowledging that the administration has recognized that for the county administrative funding, the item you'll hear later in the agenda, and has put funding in to recognize that it's still going to be a couple years before we get all of this stuff resolved and get all of these workarounds out of the system. We certainly share the goal. I'll talk more about that when we get there. But I did want to say we recognize that all of this is against the backdrop where the administration has made its best effort to quantify that and to provide proper funding for the counties to do the work. We just don't want to have to do that much manual work. We'd like to really, you know, hasten the work to get Cal here's fixed so we can just provide the best customer service to our customers throughout the state. Agreed. Thanks for your indulgence. Mm -hmm. Next witness. Good morning, Madam Chair. My name is Leonardo Rincon. I'm eligibility work, a supervisor for the county of Los Angeles. Uh, Los Angeles. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the concerns that we have regarding um, uh, the consumers. Um, I'm going to keep it grounded, right? I mean, I'm, I'm, at, I'm at ground zero here, where, I'm, where basically the, the line starts with me and with some of the eligibility workers that are here. Some of the concerns that we're having is the transparency between the communication between CalHERS and Cover California. Uh, one of the things that they addressed previously was that we did want the MAGI um, 
uh, exposed to the, to the leader system and further on to the LRS system. That would really, really uh, help out the worker mm -hmm. at ground zero. Um, having that exposed would help us out a lot. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's one of the main things that the workers uh, um, are requesting. Not only the workers, but the supervisors. Why? Because non-MAGI has it, why doesn't MAGI have it, mm -hmm. of course. Um, some of the concerns have been to Cal, like I mentioned, Cal here's in Cover, California. I have a quick scenario, and I'm gonna be really brief on the scenario, is with this individual. Individual applied for Cover, California, then his income lowered, released an application through Cal here's through our, our department, our application stayed open, was processed, was receiving MAGI. The gentleman later on uh, got a private insurance, went to Cover, California, withdrew the application. That application, because it was withdrew, withdrawn with uh, Cover California, our, our county was unable to process that medical case. It was a problem. Of course, service request, the gentleman was upset. Why? Because we had already set a, set a provider for him at that application and was unable to continue his private insurance and provider for, for, through that job. Our concern is that we're, we're, we're uh, public servants. We want to help the consumer at the end of the day. We want to make sure that they get the best benefit they could get. Uh, I know it's a process, we know it's a process, but we want to make sure we get the correct information, the cor good communication across the board with all counties regarding the process of MAGI and the evaluation and the provider information for these consumers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, appreciate it. Next witness. Good morning, my name is Omar Medina. I'm a bilingual eligibility worker with the County of Sonoma. I'm also uh, the County Industry uh, Council Chair for SEIU Local 1021, so I represent county employees in the 12 counties that we represent in Northern California. Mm -hmm. um, me as an eligibility worker and my colleagues, you know, we, we love the work that we do because we get to help people. Um, what, what I'm here today for is to advocate to ask you to help us help people faster mm -hmm. because our, our, our work has become more difficult with Cal Hears and the system has slowed us down. When I, when, I'm a frontline worker, so I interview people face to face. And uh, before I used to be able to do eight interviews a day face to face, and now we're only assigned four, maybe five a day because of the slowdown. Um, so our ability to do the work has uh, been drastically de decreased. When you multiply that by the number of workers, you can see how it's slowed down. Um, the, abil the ability to help people on a day to day basis um, is drastically decreased and it frustrates mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. um, it was good, you know, Chair, I appreciate your leadership with SB 1341. Um, we just saw that roll out this month, um, although many of the workers have expressed the concern of, with the inability to edit those NOAAs, the notices of action. Um, but the, the most critical issue that I'd like to share today is the ex exposing of the rules. Um, we've been asking for this time after time again. Um, we, we met with OSI in January didn't see it on the roadmap. Um, it's definitely a priority for us because not only does it limit us being able to explain to people why they're not eligible or not sometimes, um, because sometimes we expect a certain result and we don't get it. So then troubleshooting is something that we have to do. And when we can't see those rules, it's difficult for us to troubleshoot and sometimes it delays people's benefits or aid. There's also the consequence of error. If we aren't able to do uh, the work right or give people the wrong eligibility, mm -hmm. um, it, it could affect tax penalties. It could affect how much they pay for their health care coverage or whether they um, get uh, free get medical or not. Or, or not. Mm -hmm. So there's a consequence to the consumer mm -hmm. and also for us to be able to explain that to to the people that we help. Mm -hmm. um, so we're really pushing for that. We, we'd like to continue the work that we're doing with OSI, that collaboration. We ask for your, your help with that and to help frontline workers, OSI and DHCS, help the people of California. So thank you. Thank you very much, appreciate you. Uh, good morning, my name is Kevin Anthony. I'm with the Coalition of California Welfare Rights Organizations. And the testimony that I've heard is that there's an oversight system, but the oversight is simply from the state agencies and from the count and from CWDA. There's no oversight participation from the advocates or from the workers who are also a primary constituency of OSI, and I would urge OSI to include the advocate representation and also uh, county worker representation into that process so we're all at the same table and we all understand what's happening. And maybe if we do that, a lot of these problems would not come in year after year after year. Thank Th you. Thank you, sir. Next witness. 
Tam Ma with um, Health Access California. I'd like to align myself with the comments made by Ms. Landsberg from the Western Center on Law and Poverty. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and Senator. Joshua Golko with the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees. And on behalf of our county eligibility workers, we would just like to uh, say that we appreciate the progress that has made so, been made so far, as well as the recognition of the challenges that still exist, both as it relates to the duplicate cases and the workarounds. And we would like to echo the request for the exposure of the rules. It would be really helpful in the work that our members do. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Any, would you like to respond? Any comments you'd like to make? Um, I think one of the items that uh, continually comes up is exposure of the rules. Mm -hmm. I think uh, the eligibility workers bring up a point that says as they run eligibility, mm -hmm. what comes back from the CalHERE system is whether somebody's eligible mm -hmm. or ineligible. Mm -hmm. And in order to troubleshoot that, they do have access to be able to log on to the CalHERE's application and troubleshoot that, but it's time consuming. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that is an initiative that's going to be investigated to see how that gets designed and what the scope is in 2017 is looking at, as you run the eligibility rules, providing that budget detail back to the SAWS systems so that the SAWS systems can display that to the eligibility workers so they can't so they don't have to log on. Again, we have to have um, a scope and technically see how that would be accomplished prior to committing to a date on that, but the uh, sponsors have committed to investigate that, to start that dialogue, to be able to streamline that process so that the eligibility workers don't have to, when they're looking at that, log on to CalHERS to be able to do that and to be able to streamline that. Thank you, I appreciate it. I appreciate public comment and, and you um, presenting what you've accomplished so far. You know, I've had just enough experience in terms of building a system based on eligibility that included a payment calculator that basically determined scope uh, and, and, and amount of benefit to, to just be dangerous, you know, just enough information. But, but what my personal experience um, um, it helps me to understand is the challenge we face in applying technology um, in all of its vast capabilities to a very human process and element. You know, a situation where people are reliant on us getting it right to make a difference in them being able to access entitled benefit or not. And so it's very complicated and very layered, I get that. And I appreciate the, the focus and priority and the speed with which you are moving. And I also appreciate the county eligibility workers and the advocates' perspective about we need more now. And so it's, it's, it's this balancing act um, that, that you will have to face. Um, I do support the transition of the positions into an IT-oriented environment um, because that's where it belongs. You know, um, all, all of these social organi support organizations have to have chief technology uh, um, officers because that's the direction that the work product is moving. As challenging as that is, um, for us on the social service side, I'm clear that it will improve our work once we finally get it right. So it's the issue about how we get there in, in an expedited yet accurate way. So I appreciate you being here in your testimony today. So having heard public testimony, LAO and finance have no questions. Senator Monning has no questions. We will hold um, this item open. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to item 4260, Department of Health Care Services. We are now on page 33 of the agenda. Thank you, sir. Can you hear me getting froggy? <laughs> <laughs> thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Ready for me? I'm ready. <laughs> okay. I'm ready. Senator Bonnie bought me some water. He heard my voice getting froggy. I'm ready. Issue number one, we're going to begin with the overview. Welcome back. Hey, 
Thanks. Happy to be here. First time this year. See you several more times, I'm sure. Yep. So Mary Cantwell, Department of Healthcare Services, and also have Renee Mahler, the Deputy Director of uh, Healthcare Benefits and Eligibility, and then Karen Johnson, my counterpart, Chief Deputy Director, will be addressing other issues. Um, with respect to the first item, uh, the governor's budget for 1617 includes a total of $87.7 billion for the support of DHCS and our programs. About $19.6 billion of that is state general fund, and the rest is federal funds and other reimbursements. We also have, a, have proposals for 67 new positions, including the conversion of 18 current limited term positions to permanent, as well as uh, additional limited expenditure authority for both new work and ongoing work. Uh, as you're well aware, our single biggest program is Medi-Cal. We are providing coverage to over 13.4 million people in the state. That's over 4 million new people since 2013. Uh, the vast majority of that is the adult expansion, about a little over 3 million of the population. 4 so million new, new people, people since 2013. 13. Yes. One in three Californians today now are, are covered by, by Medi-Cal. So obviously that's the vast majority of our budget and what we'll mostly be talking about for the rest of the agenda. Outside of Medi-Cal, we do operate some other programs, programs that are specialized to focus on children and adults with specific genetic diseases. We also operate different screening programs as well as cancer treatment programs. In terms of the governor's budget broadly, we didn't actually have a lot of new major policy proposals this year with the exception of the MCO tax, which we're all grateful has already been taken care of. Um, and that obviously, <laughs> and that was obviously linked to the continuation of the coordinated care initiative, uh, which now will go through at least the end of 2017. And obviously that will be a discussion we'll have uh, going on the rest of this year. The only other major new thing in our budget is the incorporation of the Medi-Cal 2020 waiver, which I'll talk about in, in just a minute in response to your uh, later questions. So with that, I'll stop and see if there's any questions on, on this item. All right. So the next item was the Medi-Cal estimate, and there were several questions that you had for us. First, in terms of caseload, so we are projecting for the current year an average monthly caseload of 13.28 million, and for the budget year, 13.48 million. That's an 8% growth from last year to this year, and about a 1.5% growth from current year to budget year. Uh, as I mentioned before, the biggest driver of that is the expansion population. Uh, from last year to this year, we've seen an average monthly increase of 726,000. That's a 28% increase in that population. And we do project a, a modest growth in that population for the budget year. If you take out the expansion population, we have a, assumed a modest growth of 1.4%. Uh, going on to the next question about the Medi-Cal waiver. So we were very excited to finally receive approval of the waiver at the end of December after more than a year of work with many people that I'm sure are in, in the audience and others in, in being, getting something through with CMS. The waiver is a five-year waiver that started in January and will end in December 2020. It replaces the Bridge to Reform waiver, uh, and there are four major new initiatives that I'll talk about in a second, but also wanted to flag that it also continues authorities for many of our Medi-Cal programs, including our entire Medi-Cal managed care program, the Coordinated Care Initiative, CBAS, the Drug Medi-Cal Waiver, and, and several other programs. From a budget perspective, year over year, from the last year of bridge reform to this year, we're seeing a slight increase in federal funds. Um, it's, it's about the same, but a slight increase, but then over the course of the five years, there is some decreases in the funding. The four major programmatic elements that the waiver has uh, are, are the first one is for our designated public hospitals and district and municipal public hospitals. It's called the Public Hospital Redesign Incentives in Medi-Cal. Prime is the easier way to call it. Uh, this program builds on the Delivery System Reform Incentive Payment Program from Bridge to Reform. And it's really a value-based pay-for-performance incentive program for these hospitals where they'll be able to earn funds for achieving certain benchmarks and metrics in various project areas. Uh, this is new for the district and municipal public hospitals. They did not participate in the DISRIP, but it's a continuation for the de designated public hospitals. In terms of funding, it's three point, about $3.3 billion for the designated public hospitals and federal funds over the next five years, and about $466 million for the district and municipal public hospitals. 
The second piece is the global payment program for the remaining uninsured. This transforms traditional hospital funding for designated public hospitals into really a value-based payment structure. The federal funding for the program is taking former disproportionate share hospital funding and the former 236 million in safety net care pool on compensated care funding, which were mostly hospital focused funds that were done, uh, reimbursement was a cost basis. Mm -hmm. And so really didn't allow counties to focus outpatient, you know, focus on outpatient services for the remaining uninsured. This program lets them do that and actually has, an, uh, it's incentivized. And so we're really excited. We're the first in the nation to have this program and really think it will will help in providing sort of better access to care as well as more coordinated care for the remaining uninsured who, who still won't have coverage and we know we'll still have millions of those people in California. The third initiative is also one we're really excited about, the Dental Transformation Initiative. We'll talk about it a little bit later on the dental item, but at a high level, it's also an incentive payment program for dental providers. It's the first time dental has been included in our waiver. There's going to be up to $750 million over the next five years that will all be available to dental providers. So a, a significant infusion of funding into the program that we'll talk more about later. Uh, from a budgetary perspective, just want to note that the non-federal share of this program comes from state general fund savings from state-only programs that we're claiming federal funds for. So we're taking that state funding and reinvesting it so that we have the ability to pay for this program. And then the final item is the whole person care pilots. So this program is going to allow locally based pilots to target high risk, high utilizing populations to integrate not just physical and behavioral health, but also critical social services and really test models of, of that complete integration and help to support the infrastructure that's needed for that, the data sharing that's needed for that uh, in a way that we have all these disparate systems today that aren't really talking to each other. And these programs will enable funding to help them talk to each other and really provide a new way of of treating them, not only their health care needs, but also all of the rest of their needs. The funding for that is we have authorized up to 1.5 billion over the next five years, so $300 million in federal funds a year. And the public entities that are the, gonna be the lead pilot entities will fund the non-federal share. So generally from a budget perspective, year over year, again, maintained funding for the designated public hospitals, which was a critical piece of what we were all interested in doing, making sure we weren't going to have harm done to those critical safety net providers. But there's also a lot of new funding here, new funding for the dental providers, uh, new funding for those who will participate in whole person care, as well as significant new funding for the district and municipal public hospitals. So moving on to your next question, uh, it's about the applications and those that are past the 45 days. So as noted in the agenda, uh, Medi-Cal and Covered California applications should be processed within 45 days. Obviously, we all recall the conversations over the last couple of years when we had significant issues and you know 900,000 applications that were that were uh, backlogged. Today, we have about 23,000 applications that are past the 45-day mark, looking back to last August. So these are both Medi-Cal and Covered California applications. Uh, during that same time period, we had about 1.5 million applications, so it's about 2%. Uh, not that that 2% isn't important, but I think it does reflect a lot of improvement in, in the process. Um, we, we, our initial analysis shows that about 70% of those, 23,000, are adults, and then 30% are children. Um, and we also know to some degree, and actually was talked about in the last item, that some of that is duplicates, some of that is non-responders. So it's not necessarily that there's 23,000 people who are needing coverage and that those are the things we're trying to work through. We continue to work with the counties on this issue and really uh, working to address it as quickly as we can. Um, and we can see and in the reports that we are providing the CMS and we'll start uh, publicly reporting those on our website next week, that you do see that you know you had 3,000 applications from a particular week that missed the 45-day deadline. You know, if you look back at some of those now for that week, it's, you know, a couple hundred. So we're, it's definitely improving, but we, we know we need to continue to, to work to do more on that. So with that, I'll see if you have any questions for me.